Okay, good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Masterclass 5 with the topic, the importance of supply chain management in surviving a pandemic. This event is presented by Bad Education Philippines in partnership with the University of Wollongong, Australia. Before we start, just a few housekeeping reminders. This session is being recorded and um, we will share a link with everyone after the event is complete. Everyone is on mute and to stay on mute, unless requested later, to unmute for, uh, to avoid our background noise. We also invite your comments and questions. So please look at the chat box below your screen. If you have a question, please type it in there. I'll make sure the speakers um, address them at the Q&A session. And this masterclass will run for about 45 to 60 minutes. So let's um, welcome, or may I introduce our masterclass presenters for today. We have Ms. Liz Clark, the Assistant Manager for International Recruitment of University of Wollongong. Liz will give us an overview on University of Wollongong and its programs. And also we have our guest speaker, Chiara Rigoni, and uh, she will discuss or share useful information relevant to the supply chain and how businesses can be pandemic resilient or ready moving forward. So at this point, I will be handing the floor to Liz first. Liz, over to you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Manette, um, for, your, for your warm introduction. And thank you so much to everyone for joining us here today. Um, we're so impressed that everyone's out on a Saturday and joining in for our masterclass. Um, and we will be joined by uh, Chiara Rigoni, who works in our business faculty. And she will be, um, as Mona explained, talking about supply chain management, which is a degree that um, we offer here at the University of Wollongong. Now, I just want to uh, share a couple of uh, facts and interesting points about UAW before I hand over to Kiara. Now, every, every university starts with talking about their rankings, and it's incredibly important that when you are considering which university to study at, you need to look at how they're ranked globally, because you want to make sure that you're choosing an institution that will be recognised um, across the world once you've graduated, which will make you an excellent employee. So the University of Wollongong is proud to announce that we are now in the top 200 universities worldwide, ranking at 196 in the world. This also puts us at number 10 in Australia. So you can rest assured if you are looking to study in Australia, the University of Wollongong will give you a degree that is recognised globally. Our, our graduates are also ranked in the top 1% worldwide, which again means that facilitating getting a job after you've uh, finished your studies will be a lot easier you coming from a University of Wollongong degree. Now, Wollongong, um, a lot of people, when they think of, of Australia, they think of Sydney and they think of Melbourne, but a lot of the time people haven't heard of Wollongong. So Wollongong is located about one hour and a half to the south of Sydney. So it's not too far from a major city, but it is considered a regional city. So uh, the University of Wollongong actually has a number of different campuses that you can choose to study at. So as the name suggests, our big campus is in Wollongong, which is one hour and a half to the south of Sydney. And this campus uh, offers all of our degrees, from our diploma programs, our bachelor programs, through to our masters, and then on to higher degree research PhD programs. We do also have two other campuses that our students can choose to study at. So we have our campus in Liverpool, which is in the southwest of Sydney. So about 40 minutes from the centre of the city, Liverpool is a great option for students who are choosing to live a bit closer to Sydney. Perhaps you've got friends or family in the area and you're not wanting to travel to Wollongong. This is a wonderful option for students and has a range of different courses in business, law, communication and media studies and nursing as well. And finally, we have our campus up in the centre of the city, so in the Sydney CBD. And you can see in the photo um, on the bottom uh, right hand side, uh, that's actually a picture from our campus. And you can see in the window there, the, the Sydney Harbour Bridge. It's not photoshopped, that's quite genuinely the view from our Sydney campus. So right in the heart of the Sydney CBD. This is available for students wanting to study some of our postgraduate business courses. Now, in speaking of courses, you will be hearing a bit about business today, but we do have a range of other different um, study areas that you can choose to study with us here in Wollongong. 
So the University of Wollongong has 18 distinct study areas. So we're what we call a comprehensive university. So ranging from arts and humanities uh, through to the creative arts, education, we have wonderful and very um, highly ranked uh, programs in our engineering school and IT and computer science is always a popular choice with our international students. We also have a range of different health sciences, including nursing, psychology, nutrition, dietetics and medical and health sciences. But the main event today, we're going to be talking about supply chain management and supply chain management fits within our faculty of business. So I'm going to hand over to my colleague Chiara Rigoni from the Faculty of Business to talk to you about how a supply chain, a, a well-managed supply chain can help you prepare to survive a pandemic. Great, thank you, Liz. Okay, let's get started. Okay, so um, as Liz said, my name is Chiara Rigoni um, and I work here uh, in Wollongong in Australia um, at the university and my role is in the Faculty of Business um, and I work with international students like yourself, um, high school students and also high school students here in Australia. So I'm very excited and very privileged, uh, privileged sorry, to be able to present uh, with you today. Um, so I'm going to be taking you through a series um, of slides uh, that cover information information around supply chains um, and we're going to be looking specifically um, at some exporting goods and services from, from the Philippines. Um, I'm going to get you to use the chat function, sorry, if I can, because um, we're going to, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions, a couple of multiple choice questions, where I'll need you to put A, B, C or D into the chat function for me um, and, and that way that will get everybody um, engaged in the topic um, and we'll also use the chat function later. Um, towards the end of presentation if you've got any questions that you'd like to ask. All right, so getting started. So supply chain management um, can often be a bit of a new term, um, not something really that you hear about much in high school here in Australia and often overseas. So if we, if we pull all the walls down and have a look at it, um, in a very simple term, a supply chain is the entire life cycle of a product or a service. So that is how it is made, um, how it moves between every stage and how it's disposed of. So um, as well as goods and services, supply chain managers, they analyze and manage information from suppliers uh, through to middlemen um, and through to the customer and then their customers. Um, it includes managing technical processes, both within the firm, between functions such as procurement, uh, manufacturing and marketing, between organisations uh, such as manufacturers, distributors, wholesalers and retailers. So the key thing we're looking at here is managing and this is why it sits within um, a business study area within a university because it really relies on planned business strategies um, that are prepared well in advance and predict possible issues that could, cre that could create potential shortages or changes in a supply chain. Um, so the reason that this topic is um, really, I guess, on everybody's lips at the moment is because of COVID-19 and that's affecting the world. So when we look at all of the different countries in the world, including the Philippines um, and Australia, we rely heavily on exporting goods and services to, to make our economy strong. Um, and at the moment, we're you know everybody is experiencing um, a bit of a recession because products and goods and services that they usually export or import um, that's really been impacted here so i'm going to take you through a series of slides um, that discusses that um, but to get started i'm going to ask you some questions about the philippines and their particular export products and supply chains um, just to see what you might already know so if we can all use the chat function here for me um, so starting, you can see the questions on the board. So uh, what which, which country uh, did the Philippines export most of their goods to in 2019? Was it A, B or C? So A being Japan, B being the USA or C being China? If you can just use the chat function for me um, and I'll see what everyone is saying. Okay, cool, we're getting a couple of answers in there. Yep, a couple of Bs, awesome. All right, a couple of C's, which is good. Okay, yep, All right, seeing a few. Okay, so the answer for that one is the United States, but only just. So it was about 16.5% um, of the total global export from the Philippines in 2019, from the USA. 
very closely followed by Japan, actually sitting on about 15%. So there wasn't too much difference there. And then China at around 14%. So they're the top three, the top three countries that Philippines exports most of their goods to. So if we move on to the next one, I'm gonna get you to answer this for me. Um, what were the top three exports from the Philippines in 2019? Again, if you can just use the chat function for me, sorry. Um, so A, if you think it's cars, copper and medical equipment. B, if you think it's electrical machinery, computers uh, and fruits and nuts. And C, if you think it's oil, plastics and precious metals. So if you can just use that chat, chat function there for me. Okay, yeah, all right, yep. Oh, it's a mixture here, getting a few Bs, a few Cs, a couple of A's. All right, I'll put you all out of your misery. <laughs> uh, that one there is, um, it's fruits, sorry, one. So it's electrical machinery um, and equipment is the first one. So B is the answer. So that equated to around US $34.5 billion. Um, so around 50% of total exports in 2019. Uh, number two was machinery, including computers, um, and that was around 10 and a half billion US dollars. Um, and then fruits and nuts was actually number three, um, and it's around 2.6 billion. In fact, fruits and nuts was the fastest grower among the Philippines um, in the, the top 10 export categories, and it was up around 25% from 2018 to 2019. So obviously your fruit and nut production has gone through the roof there. Um, all right, and the last one I'm going to get you to answer for me um, is, sorry, there we go, this one here. So how much in US dollars worth of goods um, did the Philippines ship around the world in 2019? Was it A, 700 million, B, 23.5 billion, or C, 70.3 billion? Again, if you can just use the chat function for me, put what you think in there, okay, all right. A few different ones there. Your B's through C's. All right, excellent, great. All right, you guys know your difference between your millions and your billions, which is good. Okay, so the answer to that one there is C. So that was 70.3 billion US dollars worth of goods were shipped from the Philippines and exported out to different countries um, in 2019. Um, so you guys, um, you you send a lot of things around the world, which is awesome. All right, so we'll move into the next slides now. So let's have a look at the importance of a supply chain. So I've got an image on the screen there now because um, that's uh, they're manufacturing cars at the moment. Now in the Philippines, as we saw, um, your top manufacturers of electrical equipment, including computers, was a big one. But car manufacturing was a big one um, that's been affected by COVID-19. So the current coronavirus pandemic has put a spotlight on supply chains all over the world. Um, and now more than ever, we can see how important and well -managed, a well-managed supply chain um, is. So when most company owners or leaders think about risk to their supply chains, they often only focus on risk to supply like raw goods or products. They don't think more broadly about risks and they miss more dangerous risks to their supply chain. So for example, what we're seeing now. Um, so what we're seeing now is what we call a macro risk, which is the COVID-19 virus pandemic. So macro means large, micro means small. So a macro, macro risk is often something that affects the whole economy of the Philippines, and in this case, the whole econ economy of every country in the world. Now, the other, other common term we come across is a demand risk. So um, example, if we, rate it back, we relate it back, sorry, to COVID-19, people losing their jobs um, and not spending any money. Uh, so this is affecting many industries, including car manufacturing. Um, so if we look at a car, it's a high involvement purchase. Um, we think about it for some time. Here in Australia, the average price of a car is around 30,000 Australian dollars. But a lot of people lost their jobs during COVID-19 um, and they aren't able to purchase a car. So what we've got at the moment is a demand risk. So we've got too many cars and not enough demand for them. Uh, the other one is a transportation risk because countries are closing their borders. Right now in Australia, our borders are closed and the government just announced today that will continue until September. Um, and they may, they may even continue that to the end of the year. Um, the Philippines as well, um, you, you've had um, um, not issues, but you've, you've closed some of your borders internally as well. It's, a mu it's much harder for people to get around the country and leave the country and come in. 
The other one is what we call a production risk. So a production risk, um, and, and another example, is countries have been placed in lockdown and factories have stopped producing. So here in Australia, um, we, we weren't placed in lockdown, but our neighbouring country, New Zealand, it was placed in lockdown for around four to five weeks, and that meant all production stopped. So anything that was made in New Zealand just stopped all of a sudden. So if you had a supply chain that was relying on you to ship parts all around the world and that just stopped, what do you do about that? You need to look about where else you can get that particular product or service from. So moving on, how do we actually then reduce the risk in a supply chain in the current environment like this? Um, so as we can see on the screen, supply chain managers have a vital role to play in both alerting their businesses to potential risks, but more important, offering solutions to disruptions. So now is a really good time to step forward and be proactive in protecting supply chains as much as possible from the impact. So what can a supply chain manager do um, in the future to make sure that um, that they they're ready for something like this i mean this is a really this is a really hard example but i guess it's something that we've all been forced to think about now so what what the main thing that they can do is they can prioritize their high risk supply sources so not just by geography but by sector um, the type of good or service or the value to the business the other thing that they can do is analyze the supply chain uh, beyond um, the one tier of suppliers to fully understand the exposure to the effective countries and regions. The next part that they can do is review the business approach to stock and inventory, um, and they can build stock around their own stores to reduce impact from port delays, so shipping delays, and what additional financial resources are needed to do this if appropriate. So for example, if we look at the Philippines um, and you guys are producing a lot of computers, um, you would get parts for those computers from all different parts of the world. So when COVID-19 came in um, and think countries stopped, um, they stopped producing, they stopped close, they closed their borders, ships stopped coming in. How could the Philippines continue to make computers if they didn't have all the parts that they needed? So what a supply chain manager can do is look, look about how they can get those different parts from in their own country. Is there a way they can source internally rather than going externally to different countries? Um, you can also not rely on forecasted supply data or current in inventory levels. So what supply chain managers do is there's, there's quite a few different um, uh, industry, uh, sorry, inventory models that they follow. And one of the most popular ones is called just in time. So what that means is uh, they have a demand for a particular product and they produce that product, but it's a just in time for it just to meet the demand. But what's happened with COVID-19 is, as we said before, there's a demand risk. The demand for certain products has gone down um, and that has caused a lot of issue because now we've got oversupply. So they need to look at other ways um, of in inventory levels. So perhaps that just in time method um, isn't something that can be relied on in the future. Um, the other thing that we can do is calculate stock tolerance over a predicted, predicted period um, to determine where there is risk points. Um, and more, most importantly, as it is with all business functions, is keep communication channels open with these suppliers. Um, but that can be really hard because, um, you know, as we're seeing at the moment, there's a lot of trade wars going on, particularly with the US, uh, where we might have all been friends before. Um, there's a lot of politics happening at the moment. So it, it can't always be um, easy to keep communication channels open. Um, but that's where looking at your own country and where you can get supplies from your own country is really important. So moving on to the next one. Um, so I'm going to again bring it back to the Philippines. Um, so now you guys have experienced uh, your fair share of disasters before, including typhoons, um, mass flooding. Uh, here in Australia, we had massive disasters, natural disasters just over our summer with bushfires, which cut off a lot, um, a lot of our towns um, and, and airports and, and really affected a lot of our supply chains as well. The thing with uh, COVID-19 is nobody could prepare for this. Um, I guess we could all say that one day there would be a pandemic, but we just, because we hadn't experienced one in this century, we didn't know what effects that was going to have on the supply chain. 
So um, if we look at the Philippines, so although suppliers may still have inventories and safety stocks, as we call them, the local logistic companies are having a difficult time in moving finished goods and raw materials because of strict protocols and the checkpoints all around the shipping ports. So even though you guys are still producing computers to be sent to the US, to be spent, sent to Japan, sent to China, there's issues with shipping them out because there's a lot more quarantine um, requirements at the shipping port. And you can see here, I've got an image, this is in the Philippines, um, and this was just a particular quarantine area checkpoint for traffic going through, and that's the same with shipping as well. The other issue that you've got that we saw that the third biggest thing that you're exporting now is fruits and nuts and that's a perishable good. So um, perishable goods are a little bit tricky because if you can't get them out there they're just going to go they're going to go to waste. They're, they're, they're going to spoil like a banana if we look at a particular fruit um, and you can't send that overseas if you don't get out in time. So what that means is countries are being forced to look at what they can do with that oversupply of perishable goods. And the same thing happened in Australia here. Uh, we export a lot of our seafood, um, being, being an island like the Philippines, you guys have a lot of seafood as well. But we export a lot of our seafood um, to, to countries like China. Um, but what's happened is that, that has stopped at the moment um, because of the COVID-19. So what we're seeing now is that that particular very good grade of seafood is showing up in Australian supermarkets. So um, myself and others are getting to enjoy seafood that which would normally be shipped overseas, which is nice. Um, but they're having to sell it at a much cheaper price than what they did if they exported it to China. So it's really forcing um, countries like Australia and the Philippines to have a look at their supply chains. And although they may not be getting as much money for it, um, still, still moving that particular perishable product like seafood or, or like bananas just through a different supply chain, a local one as opposed to an international one. All right, so let's have a look at the term procurement. So it's a funny word and sometimes people have hard um, pronouncing it, even myself. So procurement is a part, a major part of the supply chain and it can manage panic buying. Now, I'm not sure in the Philippines, and I'm gonna get you guys to answer some questions for me later, if anybody was panic buying, but here in Australia and other countries, we had people panic buying months ago, and they were panic buying products um, that they thought that if we went into lockdown, they may not be able to get for a long time. So toilet paper was one of those. Uh, pasta and rice was another big item that people panic buyed. Um, people even started stocking up on uh, petrol and, and gas because they thought if we went into lockdown, how were they going to heat their homes? How are they going to get their cars around? Um, I'm not sure where they thought they'd be driving if we were in lockdown, but people panicked. Um, and it, it's not people's fault. Um, it, it, it's a natural way to feel fear um, but what happened when people panic buy is it has a massive effect on our supply chains so when you went into an Australian supermarket around two months ago if you went down the aisle where there was flour and sugar and rice and pasta it was empty you couldn't get any of it you couldn't buy it online you couldn't even buy it in the in a local in a local deli um, and you couldn't even buy it in the big supermarket chains so the supermarkets had to put um, some rules in force to stop people um, from doing that so they put limited buy so if I went into the supermarket two months ago I could only buy one packet of rice at the time, for example. Um, thankfully, things have turned around here in Australia now um, and the panic buying has stopped and the shop, the stock shelves, sorry, the shelves have restocked at, um, at the supermarket. So we don't have any of that anymore. Um, but if we look at procurement, um, it can actually manage panic buying. So we spoke about before about a demand risk in a supply chain. So that's when a sudden surge in demand, um, it catches manufacturers and retailers by surprise. So supply chain managers need to act quickly to panic buying and being agile is essential to being successful in this. So if you're working with a supplier, they should understand where the supplies are coming from and should they need to, they need to be able to speak to their suppliers directly if they're having issues with that. So governments can also assist uh, when supply chains for essential items like food um, are at risk. So as I said before, what we're seeing here in Australia and the UK with supermarket chains, um, they were working closely with the government and suppliers to keep food moving quickly through the system and make more deliveries to store to the stores to ensure the shelves were stocked. 
Um, the government's also allowed extended delivering hours for supermarkets in Australia, which meant that truck drivers can deliver stock outside of normal hours so the supermarkets could meet the customer demands, which is really good. All right, so now I'm going to get you to use a chat function again here. So did you or any of your family members stock up on a particular item um, whilst COVID-19 restrictions were in place and still currently in place in the Philippines? If you can just use the chat function and type in there some, some of the items um, that you might have honey for hand sanitizer yes thanks liz <laughs> uh yes mask alcohol yep we saw that here in australia yeah masks yes that was very the same here was toilet paper an issue in the philippines or well, that's just something that these strange australians did tissues yep that was another big one here yeah perfect so we're seeing the same types of issues um, in the philippines that we saw in australia and people panic buying on those particular products can you tell me now in the chat box, is that still an issue in the Philippines or can you get hand sanitizer now? If you can just type in there, not anymore. Yeah. Yeah, the same in Australia. So if you go to the supermarket now where the hand sanitizer was all wiped out, it's now back on the shelves. There's no issue there. Yes, but the price went up. Very good. Awesome. So that's what, um, that's another element of a supply chain is because like I said before, if we look at um, if we look at um, the bananas in the Philippines and a fruit, um, and, and they couldn't export those, so they had to sell them internally. But to cover the cost, they might reduce reduce the price of those. So yeah, that's a really good point. Thanks, Tony, for making that. All right, so moving on, um, I'll just close that down. Might be a minute. Sorry. There we go. All right, so uh, that just gives you a little bit of the background, but now I'm just going to take you more, I guess, into the study side of things. So if you were to study supply chain management um, at, at a university level, um, as a bachelor degree or a postgraduate master's degree, which you can do both of those here at the University of Wollongong, there's different types of topics. So the qualification you'll get is supply chain, um, but the types of topics included are analytics. So analytics is when we look at different data sets and, and we come, um, we, we look at the trends in those particular data sets and we help, we use those trends to help us make strategic decisions. Uh, sustaining success within a supply chain, so making sure we've got the most successful, sorry, it's a bit of a hard word to say, um, supply chain that we can have. Uh, total quality management, so the management of the supply chain. Uh, there's that word procurement again. Um, logistics, um, and then the last one there is project management. So there's different types um, of areas that you see there that you'll cover if you study supply chain management at a university level. So I'll just focus in on one of those and that's total quality management or more commonly known as TQM. So it explores modern quality management systems developed, sorry, deployed and embraced by companies and the wider supply chain. So students will learn tools and techniques such as root cause analysis, process mapping, statistical process control to drive quality management into businesses. All right, so moving on and we're going to have a look at some of the careers in supply chain. All right, I'm going to give you some examples from Australia because Australia at the moment, and in particular New South Wales, where the University of Wollongong is located, is going through a bit of a supply chain management uh, boom. Um, so jobs in supply chain areas are not only showing signs of slowing down, um, but they're also, sorry, let me start again. They're in a boom here in Australia, but they're also booming around the world, even in the Philippines as well. Um, as well. So in fact, as some of you may know in Australia, and I saw when we started the presentation, some of you are actually located in Sydney, which is great. Um, we know that um, real estate is big business in Australia. It can be quite expensive. Um, Liz so showed you before a photo of our Sydney campus on, on the harbour, and you could see Sydney Harbour Bridge um, in the background and the Opera House. If you were to buy a property there, um, it's very expensive. Um, many million Australian dollars to live there. Um, but funnily enough, uh, the most sought after property in Australia at the moment is warehouses. So distribution centres um, and anything suitable for storing stock or freight, which means supply chain management and warehousing is, is, is in the boom. Um, having places to store goods that were bought online is also equally important. 
So our supply chains are getting so big that a new airport is being developed in Western Sydney um, to cope with the demand. So this is going to be a 24 hour international airport um, and it's going to be a thriving hub for education and leading industries, including advanced manufacturing, aerospace, defence, agribusiness, and it's going to generate a lot of jobs for the area, for that Western Sydney area. So you can see there on the screen that Greater Sydney's freight task is forecast to almost double in the next 40 years. So there's going to be increasing importance placed on the 24-7 supply chain operation to maintain Australia's global competitiveness. So a good example um, of a job in the supply chain industry um, is working as a supply chain distribution or procurement management here, management, sorry, here in Australia or in the Philippines. Um, in Australia, jobs grew very strongly over the past five years uh, and expected to grow strongly over the next five years. There are likely to be around 22,000 job openings um, from now through to 2025. So that's about four and a half thousand new jobs a year, just as a distribution manager within the supply chain industry. So that gives you a, a very strong indication of where supply chain is going. And that's just here in Australia. And we're a much smaller country than the Philippines. So you could see um, just how, how much of a boom it's going through. Um, so if you want to have a look at that particular outlook and others, you can see on the screen there, there's a bit of a website that um, you can have a look at and that's called Job Outlook. So you can search joboutlook.gov.gov.au. It's an Australian government website. And you can jump on there and have a look at different types of careers within the supply chain um, industry, um, but also all careers in general in Australia. So it's a good place to start. So that's good. That's enough of all the formal presentation today. So what I'm going to do now is open it up for questions. So myself, uh, Liz and um, Manette from VADA will be available to help and answer your questions. Uh, you can ask anything about the university, about today's topic, um, about applications and how to apply and things like that. Um, and we're open to help you out. So thanks everybody for listening. And Thank let's you, get Kiara. started. Yeah, so thank you, Kiara. Thank you, Liz, for uh, that um, excellent presentation. I think I, I will now wait for people to ask questions. <laughs> I did receive, um, okay, there's one already, but let me just start off with one internal question that I have. Mm -hmm. I think this is relevant to Liz. Um, I think you mentioned some in some part of your presentation that the University of Wollongong is part of the regional area. So for That's I think nice. someone is interested, how is this different from another state in Australia? And if they are studying in this um, location, how does uh, it benefit them as, a, I guess, an international student coming from the Philippines? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so there's a lot of benefits to, to being in a regional area in Australia. Um, I think that one of one of the most important considerations um, for international students is the cost of living. Um, so that absolutely is significantly cheaper in Wollongong. Um, and, and oftentimes we find that rent in Wollongong, uh, food, uh, entertainment is around 45% cheaper than it is in a major metropolitan city like Sydney or Melbourne. So that's a wonderful benefit. Wollongong is also a, is a wonderful community. We have excellent uh, relationships with all of our international students and it makes for a very vibrant and multicultural city because of the wonderful community of international students here at the, at the university. So that's absolutely one of the benefits to living in a regional city. Now there is also um, some potential benefits for students who are interested in uh, staying in Australia to pursue some work um, prior to returning back home. So with a post-study work rights visa, uh, if you uh, study at a regional university, you'd be eligible for three years post-study work rights rather than two if you're studying at a metropolitan campus or university. Great, thank you Liz for that answer. Um, I think we'll have to wait for the borders to open <laughs> and start exploring that. Yep, um, that's we correct. We're hoping, we're very optimistic, but um, again, we are following the, uh, the advice of the Australian government very carefully. We are, however, um, offering students remote studies. So if students are still interested in commencing this year, students can start their course online. And then as the border opens, we can transition to face-to-face -face study. There's also a further 10% fee reduction for students who are choosing to do online study as well. So there's no need to wait. We shouldn't let a pandemic get in our way um, and you're still able to, to apply and to start your study in 2020. 
That's great. That's that's good news. At least uh, there can be progress while we're exactly. waiting for everything to become more safe and normal. Exactly. Uh, I think another question here is for Chiara. Is there a topic about e-commerce in the course? Yeah, sure. So um, I think everybody we're speaking to today um, is um, a bit younger. So you'd be in the undergraduate course um, option. So you'd be looking at the course. It's at our university. It's called Bachelor of Commerce and you major in supply chain management. So the good news is, is when you study that particular course under the Bachelor of Commerce degree, you will get to study other subjects in, in, in e-commerce, for example, um, in accounting and finance, uh, marketing, human resource management and economics. And then two thirds of your degree will be made up of the supply chain management um, major, which is good. So yes, you can do an e-commerce subject within that course. Um, and then I think we've got another one there about the length of the supply chain management course. So I'll continue with that one. Um, so the Bachelor of Commerce is a three year degree. Um, if you study that full time, which you would if you're an international student coming to study at the University of Wollongong here in Australia, um, it'll take you three years to finish. Um, and the other great thing about that is you can do an internship as part of that. Um, and you can do that in your second or third year and the university will organize that completely for you. So you can do an internship with um, a company here in Australia. It's an actual subject embedded into your course so you can get some real work experience. So whether you then decide to stay in Australia and work after you finish or return to the Philippines, you'll have your degree, but you'll also have some work experience that you can discuss with future employers, which is awesome. Liz has a question there about does the university offer scholarships? Did you want to take that one? Yeah, definitely. And I just wanted to quickly jump back um, just to Jonathan Cruz's question um, about e-commerce as well. So Jonathan, um, we, we do have the e-commerce subjects available um, as Kiara mentioned in the Bachelor of Commerce. We do also offer a Bachelor of Information Technology and the Bachelor of IT actually has a major in e-business. So if that's something that you're really wanting to focus on, then that would be a great op option for you as well. Um, and definitely something that we can give you some more information on um, after this presentation, we can give it to, to the staff here at Butter. Now I'll jump over to the, uh, to the scholarships question. So we do have a range of scholarships available for students. All of our scholarships available for Filipino students are what we call merit-based. So we would be looking at your results from your high school or from your university study if you're entering a master's in order to assess you for our scholarships. Now the good news is you don't need to make a separate application for scholarships, you'll be automatically assessed when you apply to the university. Now the maximum scholarship that our university offers is a 30% fee reduction. So that's a 30% of your bachelor's degree fees or your master's degree fees if you meet that merit requirement. Great, thank you Liz for also clarifying the scholarship. I think what's good is it's something that's automatically assessed upon application. It's not something that they need to. Uh, exactly, initiate. it's nice and easy. <laughs> yeah. We, so try to, we do try to keep the process as simple as possible for students. Right, right. I also wanted to mention as well, just briefly, for students who don't meet the direct entry requirements into one of our courses. So perhaps if you've studied a curriculum that isn't recognized in Australia, or if you're coming um, from year 11, potentially, we have, a pro we have a number of programs at our UOW college, which are pathways into the university. So for example, you could choose to study a diploma of business and then you would do that for one year and then articulate into the second year of your Bachelor of Commerce and can then take up the major of supply chain management that Kiara mentioned. So this is a good alternative and a good uh, reassurance for students that are a little bit worried that they would not meet direct entry into the course. There's also a range of scholarships for these diploma and foundation year programs. And again, we can provide some more information um, to Minette and to Myra to, uh, to give you some more specific info. Great, okay. Um, do we have any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? <laughs> If you don't have any questions at this point, um, we are happy to receive your feedback or other concerns. Uh, just send us an email to manila at bada.edu.com. I think it's flashing your screen right now. Um, 
And um, also to learn more about the University of Wollongong and start your journey with them, such a beautiful place, please feel free to visit uow.edu.au and um, just find out more information. Um, I think uh, Liz already posted these other um, courses or programs uh, delivered by UOW. So there, I think Liz, Kara, we've just managed to answer all of the questions for today. Not bad. And <laughs> yes, so thank you. Thank Please you. allow me to formally conclude our session by thanking everyone for joining us today on a Saturday, just after the uh, Independence Day. Happy Independence Day, everyone. And um, we hope that you found this session meaningful and productive. And a huge thank you to our presenters and guest speaker, Chiara Rigoni and Liz Clark from the University of Wollongong for making this event meaningful and possible. Um, uh, the contact details are posted there. Please feel free to take a picture, but don't worry. We will be sending you an e-certificate and details about Bada Philippines and University of Wollongong. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all again in our next event in the next coming month. So please watch out for that. In the meantime, please enjoy the rest of your day and stay safe. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thank everyone. you. Bye.